Empathy, we tried measuring empathy. It's like we use, you can measure empathy like mad if you use one measure. But if you use three, then all of a sudden your empathy measures don't correlate. So that really sucks. So the way out of that is just to use one measure, right? Well, obviously not. If your three empathy measures don't correlate, well, you've got a problem. It's like you have three rulers, and you measure something, and you get different numbers from each. It's like, really, that's probably... You're either measuring, like, bubble gum while it's stretching, or there's something wrong with your rulers. So, I don't think psychopathy exists. I think it's low agreeableness and low conscientiousness, because that would make you a predator, that's low agreeableness, and a parasite, because that's low conscientiousness. So that kind of sums up psychopaths. In terms of personality disorders, there was a bunch of them, and, you know, over the last 20 years, people have been, the psychometricians in particular, have been trying to cram those things into the Big Five structure, and they're reaching, a, you know, they're experiencing a tremendous amount of resistance from the established psychiatric community, and no wonder, but the, but it, still, the Big Five does seem to be able to provide a pretty good, good model of what constitutes personality pathology. And that's kind of surprising, because you may remember, I told you, when, when the personality measures were first originated, they threw out all the evaluative words, like evil, you know, or bad, or, or good, for that matter. And, you know, you could imagine that that would attenuate the relationship between personality and psychopathology, because you tend to use more anti, you know, more judgmental words when you're describing psychopathology, like antisocial, for example, which isn't in a personality questionnaire, but which, if it was, would likely load primarily on low, on agreeableness, low. Positive illusions, told you about that already. Practical intelligence, it's like, no, that does not exist, and there's no evidence that it exists, so Sternberg, who, who has said that part of the reason he was interested in practical intelligence was because he didn't do very well on his GREs. So, um, you know, he's got this idea that, well, there's a difference between book smarts, and that's sort of you nerdy people, and like, you know, street smarts, which is like, I don't know, the punk who makes it out in the real world, something like that. And street smarts is like practical intelligence. But the problem is, is that he never really puts his practical intelligence measures, which really don't exist, up against IQ in a fair head-to-head -head fight. And he's been just slaughtered for this in the scientific press, especially by Linda Godfordson, who wrote that paper that I had you guys read on, you know, the complexity of everyday life. Godfordson, she's a smart cookie, that woman, and she's brave too, you know, because she follows the data where it goes, and she's a very, very clear thinker. She really gave Sternberg a couple of good whacks, and he certainly deserved it. Multiple intelligences, you've heard about that, I imagine. What are they? Sensory, motor, kinesthetic, emotional, I don't remember. What's that? Interpersonal, yeah, yeah. Those aren't intelligences. First of all, A, who knows if they exist, and B, we had a perfectly good word for them, which was talent. It's like you can't just take a word, you know, like that's been studied for a hundred years, like intelligence, which has a very, very specific, uh, specific definition, more specific than anything social scientists measure, right? So if you believe in social science at all, you have to take IQ into account. He just swipes the word, says, oh, well, everybody wins. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, people have talents. Fair enough, you know, and, and they're not trivial. But to call them intelligences, and then he also says, when people harass him about his concepts, he says, well, I don't really believe in measurement. It's like, okay, okay, that's fine, except if you're, like, if you're not going to believe in measurement, then what are you doing? It's, it's not science. It might be, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's educational philosophy or something like that. But it's not science. And so it's 20 years later with his multiple intelligence theories, and there's been no published measures of them. And whenever p people have tried to measure them and set them up head-to-head -head against, say, intelligence plus personality, intelligence and personality just eats them up. And so, you know, multiple intelligence theory had a big effect on educational theory. You know, it's like, well, every child should have the opportunity to develop their own particular form of intelligence. It's like, yeah, well, that's great, except you can't measure it. We don't know if it exists, and even if it does, we, you don't know how to develop it. And you haven't shown that you can develop it. And you haven't shown that you're not doing harm by you know, pretending that these things exist and act as if that's actual knowledge. So, things that might exist. Well, I told you about these already. Well, there's lots, you know, I talked to you a lot about the big five, you know. But personality isn't that great a predictor of 
individual behavior because people are very variable in their behavior from situation to situation. So the best you ever get out of a personality measure is about 0.3 or maybe about 0.4. That was discovered in 1968. There was a big uh, hubbub about that made by Walter Michel who said, well, personality scales, they give you 0 0.2, 0 0.3, that's like 9% of the variance at best, so what about the other 90% and why are we chasing such a trivial amount? And that killed personality research stone dead for till 1992. So for 20, that's 24 years, I believe. Because everybody went, oh yeah, these are trivial effects, but then no one ever looked to see what the effects were in all the rest of psychology. Because it turned out that 0.2 and 0.3 is about on the upper end of the effects that you get in most forms of psychology, and so that even if it isn't that great, it's as good or better than whatever one else is doing. And so then there were also economic analysis, which I'll show you later, done in the 1990s that showed that because human variability in productivity is so great, especially on the Pareto distribution, that you don't need very accurate predictors for them to be extremely useful economically. Because the question might be, you know, like, so you're paying your employee $50,000 a year, and you, can, you could potentially pick an employee, an employee that was one standard deviation above the mean higher than average on conscientiousness. So, with some bad measure, you know, so over 10 employees you'd get an average of one standard deviation higher, something like that. The real question is, well, what's the economic return on that? And the answer is, well, because people are so variable in their performance, when some people do like they're crazily productive and others are like they actually detract from the function of the organization that they figure about 40 percent of managers add negative net value to the companies they work for so it's like the the productivity line doesn't end at zero it's like if you're a particularly bad manager you can be sucking money out of the enterprise like mad well it turns out that even small predictors have huge economic value so even though they're not that good the amount that they are good is better than interviews, for example, by quite a substantial margin. And so if you're going to hire people and you want better people, then you can use personality tests and that, that actually works. So what, what's real? Well, cultural factors are real. The, the effects of your peer networks, that's real. Um, the degree to which, like one thing you guys should think about as you progress through life is that, you know, there's a variety of things that make you successful. Diligence is one. Intelligence is another. Those are pretty rough. Um, the breadth of your social network, that's a big deal too. And that's something to think about. You know, people talk about, I hate this word, schmoozing. It's a horrible word. And I wouldn't recommend that anyone ever does that because that's sort of making connections for the sake of having them. But, you know, as you get older, you'll find that, of course, the people that you know get older too. And they get centralized in more and more in positions with more and more influence and so what that means is that one of the things that makes you valuable as you get older is how well connected you are in a sort of broad social network because a lot of what happens if someone comes to you and says well here I've got a problem I mean one potential response to that is well I'll solve it and another potential response is well I don't know how to solve that but I know this guy or this woman and they do know how to solve it so you know that that's an extremely useful, that's an extremely useful additional attribute. And we haven't measured that. We don't, we haven't measured that much. I think it's one of the things that give older people an edge on younger people. Younger people are smarter in terms of fluid intelligence. They're not as conscientious though, and their, their social networks are nowhere near as well developed.